So how's your week been? You guys doing okay? Yeah? Been a good week? Yeah, no, just me? I'm the only one that had a good week? I had a great week. I'm not going to tell you about it, but I just take my word for it. It's a great week. So I'm moving into a message tonight. You know, we're just not going to do a series for the next few weeks. I just, just kind of want to uh, walk through a few things I feel like God has put on my heart. And I'm uh, going to call tonight Back to Life. Now, it really came from a moment at the end of second service about three weeks ago. I was standing behind this piano, and I was leading you guys in a closing prayer, and I felt inspired by the Holy Spirit to look out in the crowd and say, some of you feel like you're a dead tree. Some of you feel like it's all dried, there's nothing on the branches, you're dead, it's over. Your days of fruitfulness are over. And I used the analogy then, and I felt it stir in my spirit. I felt like the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear that night, you'll come back to that. Because more people need to hear and understand, and I need to get more fruit out of those words. So, so basically what I shared was there are trees in my backyard that just a few weeks ago, because of that heavy snow, they lost branches. Anybody have any branches or trees with that heavy snow? It was a mess, right? And because of the long, drawn-out winter, longest winter ever, there's some trees in my backyard that really I was looking at them and saying to Deb, we got to cut those down. we got to plant some new ones. They're goners. But today, they're making me sneeze. And they're making my eyes water. You know what I'm saying? The buds are back. The leaves are there. And the Holy Spirit wants to direct to somebody tonight. You think it's dead and gone, but there's sap inside of you that's going to start running when springtime comes again. Hang on. What is now is not necessarily what will always be. God is a God of seasons. You're just in winter. Hang on. Spring is coming. And things that you thought were dead and gone, that God could not use anymore, that people disparage, and maybe you just put it on the shelf. I'm telling you tonight, they're coming back to life in Jesus' name. I want to start with this verse. 2 Corinthians 3.17, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I believe tonight in this house, he's here. We gathered in the name of the Lord, more than two or three. God said, I'll be in the midst if that happens. I'll be walking among you. We sang praises, and Scripture says that he lives or inhabits the praises of his people. So listen, the Spirit of the Lord is in this house, and he brought freedom and liberty and victory and power. So listen close. Somebody's going to leave freer than you walked in the door tonight. I believe that. Back to life. Hmm. You know, one time, as I was preparing, I felt like the Lord said, sometimes my job is to just point you to the one who's in control. So tonight, through this message, I want some of you that have been battered around and, and maybe feel like you've been tossed and turned and really dip in those deep places of discouragement to get your eyes back on the one who's in control. He's the one that's going to breathe life. Had an experience several years ago when I was traveling for business. That, that job I mentioned in Miami last week, I told you some of the story about that. I took that job, and I used to commute from the panhandle of Florida, Panama City Beach. I'd commute to Miami uh, via two planes once a month. I'd take a little puddle jumper. Anybody know what a puddle jumper is? Scary, yeah, of the devil, really not a good thing. <laughs> little planes with propellers on the wings. Maybe 20 seats. Tight. No flight attendant to bring you anything. No bathroom. Tight. Used to take one of those across the Gulf of Mexico to Tampa, get on a big jet and take the big jet down to Miami. I did that once a month, traveling there for business, doing all kinds of sales and things. So one particular August afternoon, it's a Friday, I'm leaving Miami. I take the jet from Miami to Tampa. I'm hanging out. It's time to catch my little plane. You walk out on the tarmac and you walk up the steps and it was a completely full flight. And I, and I went and I sat in the seat that I usually sit in about a third of the way back, aisle seat. And I get myself ready. I loosen my tie. Those were back in the days we used to wear ties. Loosen my tie. Put my Walkman headphones on. Oh, sweet. Oh, baby. 
got out my book. I'm going to pass the time on this flight. And I noticed something as we were pushed back and we began to head toward the end of the runway. I noticed the direction we were heading was nothing but black skies. Now, this is a small plane with propellers. Did I mention propellers? They don't get very high. And I'm thinking we're going to turn around and just wait this out or something. I mean, Florida storms over the Gulf of Mexico can be brutal. But oh no, this pilot puts the hammer down and we take off. And I'm going, oh Jesus, please, please go with us on this flight. Within minutes of lifting up off the ground and getting into the air, this thing began to rock and roll. Just that really violent turbulence. The kind where you're just, you know, oh, it's just scary. Old plane. I'm sure it's an old plane, and I'm sure those rivets have not been inspected in quite some time. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. We begin to climb. We begin to take off, and it's, it's very, very rough. It's very, very much of a, of, a, of a harrowing journey, and you figure we must be going to break through this. But, again, looking out, there was no end in sight. It's all black skies. Now it's raining very hard. We're still going up, and I realized something at this point. I was not going to be able to read anymore. I had the book out, but the plane was bobbing and weaving. I could not hold the book still. I'm not kidding. We were physically just being jostled. And occasionally, as we got a little higher, we did those really deep dips. Anybody have any of those on a plane? Oh, yeah. They'll bring you right with Jesus. I'm telling you. <laughs> they, they really will. About 20 minutes into the flight, this thing got worse. The winds were so strong, at some point it felt like we were flying sideways. Like I was looking out this way, seeing straight. We were just all over the place. And about this point, I realized something I didn't notice when I got on. I knew it was a full flight. But at this point, I realized the flight is filled with almost all women. You know why? They were screaming. <laughs> women were screaming. Okay, I was screaming too. Yes, I was. It was it was bad, but women are crying. I mean, it physically got loud on the plane, literally. It's just out of control, and there's no end in sight. And yet, we kept flying into it. About halfway through the flight, I had this thought. We're about 20,000 feet up. I said, oh, Lord, please don't let us crash. Because right about now, we're over the Gulf of Mexico, and all I could think about was the sharks. That's just all that was going through my mind. Forget the 20,000 feet. At some point, the lady next to me across the aisle, now again, the aisle was maybe 16, 18 inches. She's right there. She begins to scramble. She's crying at the time. She begins to scramble to get something out of the seat pocket from the seat in front of her, behind the seat in front of her. And I realized what it was. The stomach distress bag. And she is holding that thing while we're bobbing and weaving. And I'm thinking, if she loses it, I'm going to be wearing it. <laughs> About 45 minutes into this flight, it got worse. The turbulence was so bad at this point that the door between the cabin and the cockpit jarred loose. And it began to swing open and slam shut. That's what we need on this flight. More banging, more racket, more scary noises. And as that door opened up at one time, I could see, I was close enough, very small plane, I could see into the cockpit, and I saw the, the radar at one of the things, and it's all those colors you don't want to see, like orange and red and really bad. And yet, we kept flying. And I noticed something. When the door was opening, I could see the pilot and the co-pilot sitting there. Now, quite honestly, if I had looked in and see them doing this, <laughs> very disconcerting. <laughs> if that door had swung open and one of them is putting on a parachute, <laughs> help. <laughs> but you know what I saw? They were talking to each other and just calm. They're flying into the end of the world, and they're just chatting. You know why? Because they'd done it before, and they knew how to get through it. 
and they knew what the plane can do and they were confident in their own skills and I had a spiritual moment saying God has been through many storms navigating his people through since the beginning of time. Keep your eyes on the pilot. He's not upset. You may be getting rocked and rolled. Keep your eyes on God. He does not panic. He's in control of your life. Take a deep breath tonight. Relax in this place. God wants to encourage you and help you and get your eyes focused back on him. He said, I got this. It's going to get a little rough. You may feel a little nauseous, but hang on. We're going to land safely. I want us to look at a character in the Old Testament to kind of illustrate on this subject of back to life. The name Elijah is a very well-known name, but if you'll allow me not to assume that everybody comes from the same religious background, I'm going to do a little bit of teaching tonight, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a context of who this man was. First of all, he was an Old Testament prophet, which meant he spoke directly for God. He had the awesome responsibility. Every word that he said was in God's name was tried by the fact that if it did not come true, he would be stoned to death. You see, there was no Bible. There was nothing to compare to. So God put great responsibility. Elijah was one of those men. Here's what else. His story is mostly told in the books of Kings and Chronicles. The man was used mightily by God and some incredible miracles took place while he was in ministry for the Lord. His message was always bold and direct. Elijah was not a beat around the bush kind of guy. And at one point early on in his recorded ministry, he had a public challenge between Jezebel, the queen of Israel, her priests of false religion, King Ahab and the entire nation of Israel. And basically what he did, he gathered them on this place called Mount Carmel. He said, look, here's a, here's a chance for your God to do a miracle or Jehovah to do a miracle. And he let them have a first shot, nothing happened. And then God came through and did an incredible miracle. And revival broke out. And God's name was vindicated and people were drawn back to him. But one thing you have to know about this life of faith is there are no victory laps. Listen to me. Nobody gets a chance to come out of something and then just go around the track waving to the crowd. Thank you. Yes, I made it. No, the only thing we have in this is a finish line. When we cross that line and enter into heaven, then anything we have gained... Anything we have produced, we will lay at the feet of Jesus in gratitude for him saving your eternal soul. But in this life, what happens is we often go from times of victory into times of testing, times of solitude, and often it leads into a time for a new season. Don't be discouraged. Don't think it's strange as we looked at last week. God is working. God is in control. Oftentimes I've seen, especially as people develop in their faith, they, they have moments of just tremendous breakthrough and they, then they get hammered in the next week and everything seems to fall apart and, and all hell seems to come against them. Yes, that's what happens. But you are stronger after the victory and you will be empowered by God and you will have another testimony. Such was the case with Elijah. He's a great example. And he goes through this time of testing and solitude, and then God leads him to a town called Zarephath. Now, Zarephath was not part of Israel. They were not believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was a famine in the land, and just for the sake of moving forward in this message, I'll just put it this way. God used Elijah to create an amazing miracle for a widow and her son, provided for them to survive the famine until it was gone. And to show their gratitude, the widow allowed him to stay in basically an upstairs apartment. And that's where I want to pick up our story tonight, to look at a man and his life on the subject of back to life. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. Sometime later, this could have been years after that miracle, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse, and finally he died. Then she said to Elijah, Oh, man of God, what have you done to me? 
Have you come here to point out my sins and to kill my son? Now pause a minute. Not too long ago, Elijah saved her life and the life of her son. Prolonged it, showed a great miracle, and now she's aggressively accusing him. She used the phrase man of God, which basically she's blaming his God and taking out her anger on him. Anybody ever have anybody do that to you on the job or in life? They're not really mad at you. They're mad at who you represent. And the next verse in this narrative, verse 19, really lets us know that Elijah was not from New Jersey. Because he doesn't lash back. And he doesn't say, forget about it. What Elijah says is, give me your son. Doesn't snap back at her. Doesn't justify himself or his God. He just says, give me your son. And then he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, laid the body on his bed. Elijah was about to enter a season in his walk that you and I can learn from. Elijah was experiencing something he had never experienced before. You see, there's a good chance based on the amount of time that Elijah was staying there that he had a relationship with this young man. They may have gone out and played catch with the ball. He, he got to know him. Maybe he taught him some verses of scripture. There, he was there for a while. There had to be a connection. And now he is holding the lifeless body of a child who has passed away while he was upstairs. Let's continue in verse 20. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord. Catch this now. This should encourage somebody. You know what he says to God? Oh, Lord, my God, why? Why have you brought this tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? Let me tell you something, church. Be encouraged. It's okay to ask God why. There was a time in my life where I was raised in a certain uh, religious influence, not by my parents, in another place, and I was told that asking God why is a sin. Scripture is filled with people that in their distress and their perplexity, they said, God, why? And God did not kill him, and God will not strike you dead either. God knows how we're made. He allows us the opportunity to ask, to get it out, to even vent, to express our frustration. He allows us that because he made us. He knows how we're made. And then when it comes out, it gives him an opportunity to meet us at our point of desperation and need. Elijah cried out, why, God, did you do this? And the next verses say he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord. This time he says, oh, Lord, my God, please. First time he said, oh, Lord, my God, why? Now he says, oh, Lord, my God, please. He'd got it out. He'd been tender. He had a change of heart. And he's saying, I may not know why. I may not need to understand, but I need you right now. Please let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's prayer. And the life of the child returned, and he revived. I want you to understand something. This is the first Recorded resurrection from death in all of scripture. Elijah had no precedent. He couldn't look back at old manuscripts and say, well, you did it for Moses or you, you did it for this one. There was no looking back. This was totally new miracle territory. The child is revived. And the narrative ends with this. Chapter 17, verses 23 and 24. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room, gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. And the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. He was holding something that was once vibrant that was now dead. And God showed his nature and his heart and his character and his power over everything in this life. And I feel like sometimes we may 
not be dealing with physical death, but oftentimes in a, in a crowd this size or a, a congregation this vibrant, there are some that feel like you're holding something that used to be alive and now it is dying. It is on life support. Some of you are dealing with relationships, a marital situation that was once so beautiful, but now it seems like it's lifeless in your hands. Some people's finances once were so alive and great, and now just through no fault of your own, things have plummeted. And sometimes it's physical health. Sometimes it's the call of God. Some of us have heard God in our heart, or just a whisper so profound, calling us into some form of ministry or service. But time goes by, and life beats us up, and the tree looks like it's barren and dead, and we're ready to cut it down. God says, I can breathe life back into that call. And sometimes it's our dreams. Oh, man. Some of you are so gifted and you had aspirations of using those gifts for the betterment of other people and God's glory. And yet time has passed and nothing has happened. I'm telling you tonight, God can bring it back to life. Let's look at the example of Elijah and, and be encouraged by the truth of this account. Elijah replied, give me your son. And he took the child from the body from her arms and carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying. I want to look at this tonight and I want to talk to you for a few moments on the subject of the secret place. So what I'm talking about here is we have discussed often in weeks and we did a, a prayer series not long ago about how important it is and vital to constantly be communicating with God. Talk to him when you get up in the morning. Talk to him while you're having your breakfast. Talk to him while you're driving in the car. But there are times where the demonstration of his power and faith only are manifest through times where we get away to a secret place. I don't mean a place that's hidden. I mean a place that's separate. A place that's private. A place where you can pour out your heart and you can just allow God to talk to you. Without distraction. Many of us know the verse in Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. It's so precious. He who dwells, which means lives in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. We can enter that secret place, that private place, so dejected and so discouraged, but something about being in the shadow of the Almighty, it stirs up that, that truth and it stirs up that praise. He's my God and I trust in Him. There was one account in Scripture where Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, when you go to pray, go to your most private room. Close the door. And pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. Listen, let me highlight a couple of things. Jesus said when. He is assuming that you and I as his followers are going to pray. Not if, but when you pray. The private place, the private room, that is not all the time. We're to constantly communicate with God. But there are times we are going to have to go and close the door. That translates very much in a practical sense. Shut out all distractions. That's not easy. I can tell you some of the times lately with this church and the growth and the needs and the challenges and, and the opportunities and the blessings. Sometimes I have had to not just drive down the road talking to God. I have had to go to my room at home and close that door. And you know what else? The most painful part? I had to shut off my phone. Don't want to feel the vibrate. Don't want to hear the buzz. Don't want to hear the ding. Don't want to hear the ringtone. You know why? Because Jesus said, shut the door, close the door, all distractions. Why? Because in some of those places, that's the only way God can get through to us. And in that secret place, in that place that is cut off from everything else, for those moments, it is just you and God. It's your voice and then his voice. That's the first place Elijah went. He didn't go to the temple. He didn't go to the altar. He went to the secret place. And there his faith was ignited. Here's what else. 
In verses 21 and 22, it says he stretched himself out over the child three times and crowd, cried out loud, Oh, Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. As I mentioned, there was no precedent for a resurrection. So you know what this speaks to me of and to you and I? Faith is risky. Faith declares things that seem impossible. Faith asks for things that seem absolutely incredible. But we see by the example of this patriarch of the faith that if we are willing to speak what we need and to speak God's word and to speak and trust in who is in that secret place, God can do amazing things. Life would not have come back to that child if he hadn't asked for it. And what he was asking for was incredible. So what do you need from God tonight in your life? What huge mountain is in front of you? What challenge is eating you alive, keeping you up in the middle of the night? What is it? Are you willing to let your faith be risky? And ask God boldly for what seems impossible, for what maybe others said is ridiculous. I'm telling you, for me to post a building fund thermometer of $150,000 for a church that's just over two and a half years old, that's crazy talk. But faith is risky. And guess what happens? When we hit that number. When we're worshiping in our new facility, we're going to praise God. We're going to give him all the glory. Yes. And guess what? That should inspire you in your individual situation. If God did it for him, if God did it for others, God will do it for you. Faith takes the risk, and then God gets the glory. There's one point in Scripture where Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 he enters this house, and there's a whole bunch of blind dudes in there. Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, they're all in there, just hanging out with Jesus. And Jesus says to them, I'm just kidding. No translation says Ray Charles was there. <laughs> Jesus says to them what seems ridiculous. He says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They wanted healing for their sight, and before he did anything, he's checking their faith meter. God says to you tonight, do you believe I can do what you asked for, even if it's crazy? God's asking somebody in this house, do you believe I can do it? Are you willing to ask me? Are you willing to put it out there and then watch me do it? When that angel talked to Mary in Luke chapter 1, before he left, he said, for with God, nothing is or ever shall be, say it, impossible. Nothing. Nothing. Ooh do you believe God can do it? What's in your heart right now? What dead tree are you looking at in your life saying, cut it down, use it for kindling, use it for firewood, and God is saying, do you believe I can bring it back to life? Do you believe that dream, that call, that marriage, that relationship, those finances, that career, do you believe I can bring it back to life? Nothing is impossible for God. Mm. Let me give you one more thing we should see from this account. Verses 23 and 24. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. The woman told Elijah, you got to get it. I got to highlight it. She said, now I know for sure. Wait, not too long ago. God used this man to provide oil that never ran out and flour that never ran out in a jar. I mean, now you know. Yes, listen, take encouragement by this. For when your victory comes, you will point others to God. They will see and they will believe. They will say, they're just a the person I work with. If God did it for them, i got to find out who this is. It's the way a testimony, it becomes powerful. It spreads beautifully. You allow, you allow that testimony to come out. I love in Psalm 40, verse 3, 
This guy was going through a hard time. Came out of the muck and the mire. And now he says, God gave me a new song to sing. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. So it is in your life. When the answer comes, sing it from the rooftops. When the answer comes, give that testimony. And many will see and be amazed. And they will put their trust in the Lord. I'm telling you, there is such blessing in that. One of the young men that was with us in the first service came to me afterwards and he, he said, I can relate to this. There was an individual that, you know, just didn't even know God and there was this that friendship relationship there, but he just kept shining his light and God changed her heart and God brought a reality and now this person is following God faithfully through the example and the testimony of someone sitting in these seats next to you guys week after week. Do you believe, Jesus said, do you believe I can do this? So let me wrap it up. Faith is renewed in the secret place. As you grow in your walk with God, find a place to hide away. Once in a while, especially in those desperate times, find a place to shut out all distraction. Find it. I know some of us, our living situations can be tough. I get that. But find a place. Maybe you have to do it in your car. Just make sure you're not driving at that point. <laughs> and shut out all distraction. Because faith is renewed there. Faith is risky. Ask God for the impossible. Stand and believe on his word. And then faith equals your testimony, which brings glory to God. So I want to give an opportunity tonight in this house for God to confirm his word in individual lives and hearts in this place. It's just us here. We're just family. We're people walking through this life with needs and challenges and victories and all kinds of other things. And tonight for a few moments, I think we need to respond to the Holy Spirit. We're going to provide an opportunity in this front corner to have people pray for you. What's died in your life? What's on life support in your life? What do you need to see revived? Jesus said, do you believe I can do it? On a Saturday night in West Hampton, do you believe I can do it? One more thing I want to highlight to motivate you tonight and to fight through your fear and self-consciousness in these moments. Elijah replied, give me your son. Now wait, pause there a minute. She did not give him her son. Scripture says he took the child from her arms what's my point you and I gotta be proactive if we're gonna see life come back you gotta be proactive I'm not gonna come and pull you up to the front although some people I could I feel a sense of the Holy Spirit some of you I feel like God's got his hand on your heart right now I'm just saying respond to it because he, he wants to meet you in this place he wants you to leave those doors different than you came. Encouraged, lifted up in your faith, strengthened, and even seeing some buds already start to form on that which was dead. Would you bow your heads for a moment tonight? Father, for these precious moments in your presence, I give you thanks. For your strength and your grace and your mercy. For the voice of your Holy Spirit, I give you thanks. For the inspiration of your word, oh God, thank you. Now, Father, in these few moments, I'm asking there to be a release of the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking there to be strength to break through fear, to break through anything that would inhibit an answer coming on this night in this house. And Lord, I ask for the anointing on each of those that are praying for individuals, that there would be a release of life this house on this night in Jesus name I'm going to have the worship team sing for a few minutes if you need prayer something needs to come back to life join us in this front corner I'm going to put this mic down I'm going to head over there and I'm going to jump in the trenches with you guys I want to see God bring something back to life in your heart in your spirit in your walk for his glory we're going to do it now join us in the front go ahead sing that your faithfulness I'm 
broken. I just want to sing that, then let's get out of here in victory tonight. What's, what key are we in? My heart, my heart stands in all of your name. Your mighty love stands strong to me.
Father, let us go with a sense of renewed determination. Fight and faith. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for walking among us. Bless every home and family represented. Love them, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you.